guys. Here we are, chapter 15, section 2A. This is one of these that we're going to break down into an A and a B. So here we go. A, we're going to talk specifically about crops and soil. We're still trying to feed a hungry world, right? Your essential question for this one. Why is there a need for soil conservation? Dirt, it's everywhere, right? Why do we care about it? Well, let's take a look and see if this soil or dirt is actually just everywhere. Now, first off, we're talking about crops and soil. We need to talk about agricultural land, also known as arable land. This is land that can be used to grow crops. Earth actually only has a limited area of agricultural land. Land that's actually good for growing crops. Not all land is, like you might be on a steep mountain, right? Or maybe all rocks are rocky, or it's too dry, not enough rain, all kinds of reasons. However, as the human population continues to grow, the amount of agricultural land per person decreases. So if you look at the chart, you know, human growth is on this huge J curve, right? Straight up. Now this is like 2000. We're closer to 8 billion people on the planet now. However, the amount of land on the earth isn't changing. And the amount of land that's actually good for growing crops stays the same. More and more people, same amount of land, less land per person, if you will. Now, when we talk about agriculture, we're going to talk about traditional and we'll talk about some modern farming methods. So let's just talk about traditional, old school farming, if you will. This goes back to practically time immemorial, just what humans have been doing as long as the agricultural revolution came along, some 10,000 years ago. The basic process includes plowing, we're going to turn over the soil, fertilizing, putting nutrients back in the soil, irrigation, water, and pest control. Now, the oldest method of this is seeds fall, it rains, things grow, and, you know, wasps eat the caterpillars or birds eat the insects. But, you know, just going away from how it just happens in nature. Traditionally, plows are either pushed by the farmer or they're pulled by livestock. Cow, oxen, horse, donkey, something. So either we were pushing it by hand or we hooked it up and something was pulling and we were kind of directing it and keeping it in the correct line. These help crops grow because they mixed up the soil nutrients. We got the stuff down and mixed in the stuff on the top underneath so it began to mix in. It also helped the crops grow by loosening the soil particles and uprooting weeds that were in there. Then we would put in organic fertilizers, such as manure, cow pot, poop, pig poop, sheep poop, whatever kind of animals you happen to have around, you would toss that out into the field. And then the fields were irrigated by water flowing through ditches. We would dig out the little rows, there'd be a little groove, plants would grow, kind of like back here, those little grooves. And then we would allow the water to rush in and kind of flood the fields, and then the water would seep down into the roots. And these traditional techniques have been used by farmers since, you know, just the earliest times. We've literally been doing it for thousands of years bringing us into some of the more modern practices. And once again, as we learned in the 50s to the 70s, we had the Green Revolution. So most of these modern practices we're gonna talk about, oh, from started in around the 70s, 60s, 70s, something of this nature. So in most industrialized countries, and in most developed countries, the basic processes are now carried out using these kind of Green Revolution techniques. We're using machinery. No longer are we having a cow pull our plow, we're using a tractor to till up the soil. The tractor is plowing the soil, it's also harvesting the crops. We're using synthetic chemical fertilizers that we can throw out onto the ground instead of manure and plant materials. 
And then we're using a variety of different overhead sprinklers, drip systems, low pressure irrigation sprinkler systems, and synthetic chemicals to kill pests. So gone are the days of pushing a plow, hoping it'll rain, and hoping the pests don't get us. We're now using tractors, fossil fuels to dig it up much quicker than we used to be able to. We're throwing chemical fertilizers and we're throwing chemical pesticides onto the field to make sure nothing's going to kill the crops. No weeds are gonna grow, no bugs are gonna come after it. So, traditional versus some modern practices. So we need fertile soil. I mean, that's the living earth, right? That's the magic stuff, the dirt that we can grow anything out of. So soil that can actually support the growth of healthy plants, we simply call it fertile soil. Not all soil is fertile. This is topsoil, that very top layer, surface layer of soil, and it usually is very rich in organic material than the subsoil, the stuff down below it. Now, most topsoil is only about 12 inches. Most places, more like six or so. 12 inches is really good. Uh, maybe out in our heartland area of America, the old grasslands, maybe as much as 18 inches. But anyway, it's just this top layer. It has all kinds of stuff. It's got living organisms in it, bacteria, grubs, beetles, ants, termites. It's got rock particles. Water is all down in it. Air, oxygen is trapped down in there and all sorts of organic material, right? Little dead bits of plants, all those bugs that live down there die down there as well. So all these decomposing organisms are all made up in this soil. Now in the soil, there are several layers that lie under the topsoil. So we go from topsoil and we go all the way down at the bottom to what we call bedrock, the solid rock from which the soil is actually originated. And since it was all originally rock, it slowly broke up. Well, let's take a look at this fertile soil and the layers. So if you look at the picture back here, the very, very top is what we call surface litter. This is like in my yard, I gotta rake up the leaves or the grass, eh? okay? Surface litter, the stuff just lying right on the top. It's gonna be fallen leaves, partially decomposed organic matter, the dead grass, little bugs, whatever, just surface litter, right? Laying right on the top. Then right under that is the topsoil. Once again, ranges anywhere from six to 12 inches. Give, take, it depends on where you are, all this kind of stuff. So it's gonna have some organic matter in it, living organisms, it's got rock particles, sand, little bits of everything, so little bits of sticks and rock, big pieces, small pieces, the whole nine yards are in it. Moving down, we get what we call the zone of leaching. This is just gonna be some dissolved or suspended materials that are moving downward. Some of our minerals and vitamins, et cetera, up in that soil as it gets wet, it's a leaching area. Some of that stuff is leaching down into the farther zone. Then we have the subsoil down below that. Here's where we're starting to get some larger rock particles. There's still some organic matter, but it's more in organic matter. Not as much of the living stuff, not as many bugs or things crawling down in here. Up in that topsoil, we're gonna have all kinds of things, termite mounds, ants crawling down, worms in it. You get down to the subsoil layer, you're not really getting much in the way of organic, mainly in organic. Then we get down to where we're just getting mainly rock particles. This is kind of some broken up rock. And this is going to be right above the bedrock. Solid rock layer is right under that. This bedrock, this is where typically like the aquifer begins to form. This makes it look like this whole thing is maybe only three feet deep. This could be 20 feet. You know, those layers can be much thicker. Topsoil about a foot, but the zone of leaching can be a while. The subsoil zone can be several feet. So this is not like a two scale necessarily. And it depends on where you're from. These layers are drastically different in different places and different areas. In Florida, we tend to have a lot of sandy soil and our topsoil is not real thick. We give way to sand pretty quickly. Then it gives way to limestone getting into our aquifer. You go out in the Midwest and you're in the Great Plains area and you may have like 18 inches of topsoil, really nice, thick, rich, and deep. And it's a long way before you get the bedrock. Just depends on where you are. 
Now, most soil forms when the rock below gets just broken down. It really starts way down at the bottom. The rock breaks up from weathering, whether it's chemical weathering, physical weathering, the rain hitting it begins to break up. The minerals in the rock react with other things, form new materials. Temperature changes cause it to contract, expand and contract, cracks up. Now, it can take hundreds or even thousands of years for these geological processes to just form a few centimeters of soil. So if we go back, we're talking about that primary succession, and it was originally rock, thousand years just to make a little bit of topsoil. Once it's already there, the process can be hundreds to thousands to continually. Now it's a renewable resource, if you will. It's continually being remade as things die, fall in, rocks move around. But depending on where you are, if it's warm and you have a lot of rainfall, the soil gets created quicker than if you're somewhere that's fairly dry. So how long it takes for a centimeter of topsoil to be created by nature can change. But usually it's an area of 100 years or so to make about a centimeter of soil. It's renewable, but really just barely by our definition. Now, other processes also help it out. You know, the rock particles are supplying nutrients to the soil because we need things like iodine and iron and vitamin A and vitamin C. And a lot of this is trapped in the rocks. So as they break apart, these minerals and vitamins can leach into the soil along with nitrates, phosphates, things that the plants need. Then we have things like fungi and bacteria, right? It's the living earth. The soil is actually literally alive. We do that, it's just dirt. Uh, it's so much more than just dirt. These fungi and bacteria are decomposing all the little dead plants, that organic matter, whether it's sticks, grass, leaves, a dead bug, a worm, what have you. They're all breaking it down and adding those nutrients back into the soil. The nitrates, the phosphates, all this stuff that a plant needs to survive and to thrive. Then we have all those other things down there, like the earthworms, right? They're aerating it. They're going through and they're kind of eating, chomping it through, getting some of it in, pooping it out the back end, adding more nutrients into it. The termites, ants down under there, helping plants grow by breaking up the soil and allowing water and air to get in. If it wasn't for all these critters and creatures down there digging in some, we wouldn't be able to get water to seep down in there. Now, if you take a look back here, this is my favorite guy, the naked mole rat. We didn't even think about little things like ants and termites and worms getting a little bit bigger, but oh my goodness, we have moles and, you know, this, this thing's like this long, not counting its tail, the naked mole rat. It literally uses its teeth to carve and make holes. We have all kinds of things down in this living earth, just making it possible for everything to grow. We need all of that stuff happening. So that's our soil, topsoil, the layers, what have you. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our practices lead to soil erosion, and this is really a growing global problem. Now, erosion in general is just the process where materials of the earth's surface get loosened, dissolved, or worn away, and then get transported from one place to another, water of which is king, but of course, it can be wind, it can be water, ice can happen, and even gravity, you know, it just falls. Now, gravity is kind of the driving force between all of it because the water is flowing downhill. Just keep in mind, when it comes to erosion, water is king, water, and then wind. Of course, ice and gravity is it chips things and they fall off. Now, in the United States alone, about half of the original topsoil has been lost to erosion just in the past 200 years. Half of our soil gone in just the past 200 years. Now without topsoil, plants can't grow. Without topsoil, crops cannot be grown. Yet, almost all of our farming methods increase the rate of soil erosion. The very process of farming encourages or leads to more soil erosion. So kind of what do we do? But it's this land degradation that we're referring to. Now, land degradation occurs when human activity or natural processes damage the land to the point it can no longer support the ecosystem. 
It could be a flood washes everything away and now the plants aren't there so things can't grow back and it's degraded the land. But a lot of times it's human processes that are doing it. We keep taking nutrients out of the soil, nutrients out of the soil because we're pulling it out of the ground and we're selling it somewhere else. Now we can try and add fertilizers back in, but once again, as the soil gets thinner and thinner, we just can't grow it as well. If we degrade the land enough, we can get a phenomenon known as desertification, where these activities, possibly even climate change, not getting enough rain, things change in the system, it gets too arid and things won't grow. Once again, if we don't have plant life, it's not trapping moisture in, it's not re releasing moisture up into the sky, and it gets drier and drier and drier. And this process of desertification is causing about 10% of our arable land to disappear. It is a ongoing problem that we know is occurring and we even know what some of the cause is, but unfortunately, a lot of the cause is our modern farming practices. Now, there are many things, many ways, many tools that we have to manage our topsoil and reduce erosion. As a general rule, erosion is going downhill, right? Gravity, water is following the path of least resistance and it's carrying our soil downhill. So many of our soil conservation methods are just to, there to prevent this downhill erosion. So we build terraces. If, you have, if you're farming in steep slopes like back here, well, we build terraces. That way when the water, it just spills off into the next terrace. But if it was a slope, all the soil just washes and gets pushed away. So if we're trying to grow crops on a steep slope, we terrace it. Because if we just try and grow them on the slope, well, whenever we remove all the vegetation, the soil just washes away and it's horrible. So we come up with terraces. If it's really steep, we have to use terraces. If it's sloping or gently sloping, we can do what we call contour terracing. This is where instead of taking the tractor up and down and the crops going up and down, we take them side to side. So that way when it runs off, it kind of hits this layer and that layer and that layer and all the soil doesn't just wash away. This contour terracing really helps keep the soil from just once again, washing and eroding completely away. Another method is leaving strips of vegetation across the hillside. So I'm kind of contour, but I'll leave an area right here where I never plow it. I never turn it up or over. It constantly has vegetation on it. Or if I do plow it, I'm growing different crops. So I may not plow this, but I leave this crop. And then when this one's grown, I can plow this area. The idea is we want to leave vegetation to catch any soil before it is able to wash all the way downstream. We take all the vegetation off of the slope, and then when it rains or it's windy, soil gets carried away. This is how we're currently losing a lot of our topsoil. So we're having to change some of our practices and make use of new techniques that keep erosion from occurring. Still, there's a lot of areas where the land just isn't really good for growing crops and trying to contour terraces is just gonna to lead to more and more erosion. And in this case, we're really better off just using it as rangeland, just allowing it to grow naturally, whatever's there, and putting animals out to pasture. Sometimes the best option to protect our topsoil is not to farm on it. Leave it and use it for rangeland for cattle instead of trying to turn it into cropland, which it's not very ideally suited for anyway. Also, one of the more modern methods that we're using, especially in a lot of developed countries, is no-till farming. A crop is harvested, but without turning the soil over. So I pick all the soybeans, but I leave the plant matter. And then we just put the seeds right amongst the remains of the next crop. So we'd have somebody just kind of digs it down, drops the seed, pushes it down, drops the seed. So instead of tilling everything over and disturbing all the land, there's actually a lot of negatives that happen with that. It's releasing nitrates that are escaping, which we need in the ground. It's releasing carbon dioxide, which is trapped in the ground. And when you destroy all that root structure, it's actually releasing water from out of the ground. These are all things we actually want to preserve in the ground. 
if we leave all that vegetative matter, the topsoil doesn't wash it away because the root structure is keeping it intact. It's trapping nitrates in the ground. We get the organic benefit of this leftover plant matter back in the ground. All of this is a benefit. So the first crop holds the soil in place. We just put the next crop over and it grows up through it. Although it does save time and reduces soil erosion, it's just not suited for all crops and it can be expensive. If you don't have the equipment to do no-till farming and you have the old till, you have to sell your old stuff or get rid of it and buy new equipment. So it's not suited for all crops and it can lead to lower crop yields over time in areas that it's not done well. A lot of the places that we can do it, we are. Once again, it's just not suited for every situation. So it comes down to enriching the soil, right? This living soil, this topsoil, what we desperately need. It is eroding, and what can we do to enrich it? Now, traditionally, it was fertilized by adding organic matter, typically cow poop. This was kind of you know, our best thing. Anything that would decompose. Now, it could be a compost. We took, could take plant matter, set it off the side against a partially rot, animal manure, anything. We try and work it back into the soil. And this put nutrients in the soil that also improved the soil texture. They would trap all that stuff in there. However, the inorganic fertilizers, you know, stuff like this, just pellets that we're tossing out on the ground, they do contain the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, and it's drastically changed our farming methods. Without them, the food production would be about half of what it is today. But if erosion occurs in areas where we're fertilized with inorganic, the waterways also become polluted. Because when we're throwing out this type of fertilizer, it can actually easily be washed off. And then the runoff goes into our waterways and this pollutes our waterways, causing the algal blooms, eutrophication of our streams, which can lead to aquatic ecosystems crashing. So traditionally we've used manure and compost. and This was really better for the soil. Our modern day fertilizers have dramatically changed the landscape of our ability to grow more crops per acre and more pounds of food per acre, but they also can lead to damaging of our other ecosystems, especially the aquatic ecosystem. However, today, the most modern methods that we're really after, it's really a blend of the two. We did traditional farming for a long time. When, oh, science has the answer. We'll use this inorganic fertilizer, it's better, and it has helped our crops grow tremendously. But what we are realizing is it's actually a mixture of both that works best. We need to put some of this natural material back in the soil to help protect our topsoil from eroding away and building it back up naturally, along with using the inorganic fertilizer. That way we're using less inorganics so they're not flowing off into our waterways as much and the traditional helps build the soil back up. So it's using this combination of the boat. We use a lot of compost. Compost is just that, the plant matter. Now you have compost in your backyard. I'll post one of my videos of a small compost you can put anywhere, uh, allows worms to come in and decompose it. But a lot of it's just using compost, just this plant matter that begins to slowly rot down. And actually, a lot of cities and industry right now compost the yard waste. Like here in Gainesville, you put your yard waste out on the side. Well, they bring that up, they blow it into a chipper, they take it out and they throw it into an area out in a uh, large area that the city owns and they allow that to start composting. They turn around and they sell that back to farmers or even just a local person can go and you can buy a compost soil from them to add to your garden. So a lot of cities take advantage of our yard waste, the stuff we're trying to get rid of, and turn it into compost. And once again, selling it back to the farmers, and even you and I, local gardeners, can go get this. It saves a lot of money and costly landfill space. You know, instead of just throwing the stuff out the trash, turning it into compost that we can actually use. Lots of good things that we're doing. This wraps it up for section A, if you will. Come back next time when we get more into engineered crops, GMOs. Take care, guys. We'll see you next time.